still be effective after. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, JR, this is working okay, I think so? Okay, great. All right. Well, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Antoine Browes visiting us here in Boulder this week. Uh, Antoine leads the Quantum Optics Atom Group at the Inst Institut d'Optique in Paris, where he started in uh, about 2003. Uh, Antoine is a prolific scientist in the areas of many-body physics using arrays of individual cold atoms as well as light matter interactions and small and dense cold uh, atomic clouds. Uh, in addition to studying really spectacular science, some of which we'll hear about today in these interacting atomic systems, Antoine is really the pioneer of sort of all the ingredients that went into the burgeoning area of quantum simulation and computing with Rydberg atoms, um, including concepts for manipulating atoms and optical tweezers, um, creating defect-free optical tweezer arrays, moving atoms around to do this, um, and the first demonstration of entanglement of atoms using Rydberg blockade. Uh, so, Again, great pleasure to have you here. We're here more today about the flavors of his work um, uh, on many body physics with arrays of individual atoms and optical dipoles. Um, he'll also be giving the physics colloquium tomorrow if you want to hear even more, uh, and also around tomorrow if you haven't had a chance to meet him. So welcome, Antoine. Thank you very much, Cindy. So, <laughs> so a very, very big thing for the introduction and especially for the invitations. I'm for me, it's very uh, impressive to be this holy place of AMO physics in the in the U.S., but not only in the U.S., actually in the world. So indeed, I actually have two talks, right? And uh, this one, because I'm assuming that qubit means that there is a bit of a familiarity with quantum physics, this one is slightly oh, more technical. The, the, the microphone is on. Oh, so it's just that uh, uh, I need. <coughs> Sorry about that. No, no, but that's fine. So I should. Repeat again, so, <laughs> uh, so I thank the organizers first, <laughs> and second, so I have two talks. Uh, this one is the slightly more, uh, actually in the reverse order, the general talk is tomorrow, and the slightly more detailed talk is today, but I make sure that it's totally self-consistent, there is only like 10% overlap between the two talks, so in principle you won't hear the same story twice. Uh, so indeed, I mean the titles are pretty close, huh? but here I will cover actually two topics, while tomorrow I will only focus on the Rydberg uh, platform. Uh, so, technically speaking, we are not in Paris, despite the Eiffel Tower here. We are on the campus of Université Paris-Saclay, which is uh, 20 kilometers south of uh, Paris. Uh, so, uh, and this is actually the largest uh, science campus uh, in France. All right, so uh, this is our group at Institute Optique. Uh, when we had actually many interns, so the group is a bit smaller than that. So there are actually three staff members, including myself. So there is a Thierry and uh, Igor. So we are all CNRS employees, a bit the equivalent of NIST employees, if you wish. And uh, we have uh, many uh, postdocs and PhD students uh, helping us, and all of them uh, contributed uh, to what I'm going to discuss today. Uh, the thing which is kind of important for us uh, and for many experimentalist groups uh, in the field is to be very well connected to theorists. Because when you study many body physics, uh, it's an entire world, and uh, we have a very, very fruitful collaboration <laughs> with Norm Yao uh, in Harvard, Andreas Lushley in Lausanne, Tommaso Rosilde, and many others. And I should point out that we also have on the second project I'm going to discuss a very fruitful collaboration and discussion with Anna Maria uh, Ray uh, here and Derek uh, Cheng, and also with Anna Senro Garcia at Columbia. So you see it's kind of a lot of connections that we need uh, in order to uh, guide us and also to uh, simulate uh, our systems. So, <clears throat> very briefly uh, speaking, what we do in our group is we study many body physics from the point of view of building the system atom by atom. So we use these synthetic quantum systems and the, the, the goal of this field is trying to understand what happens if you take a bunch of atoms or quantum particles that are very strongly uh, interacting and that needs to be quantum. So you need all those ingredients to make the thing interesting. So why would you do that? There are actually, in my views, like kind of three uh, motivations. What we built are, of course, synthetic artificial systems. So, I mean, there are toy model systems with which first you can gain some intuition about many body physics just by building your own many body physics, starting from one, two, and then uh, adding more and more. So essentially, you kind of, in a very selfish way for the experimentalist, and build, uh, develop an intuition starting from the simple to the complex. Uh, the second thing, and I hope it will become apparent uh, in my talk, but also in the one of tomorrow, is that it's useful for theorists. They are not only guiding us, I have the arrogance to believe that they need us as well, in the sense that because the systems are a bit challenging to simulate, they need 
to develop new theoretical methods to think about these systems and to also simulate uh, the outcome of the experiments. Uh, so there, there is really this idea that those machines now forces the theorists to develop new theoretical methods to, uh, to explain uh, what we observe in the lab. And the third thing, which will hopefully become also apparent here, and this is a thing that is very, very well uh, uh, you know, studied uh, at GILA, is those machines can be viewed as generators of interesting quantum states, not only for many body physics, but also for precision measurement, for example, or quantum metrology. So uh, those are the kind of motivation from my point of view. And of course, the hope is that by developing and going this route at some point, we will be able or the, someone in the community will be able to really tackle a problem which is really outstanding. Like, we know, trying to understand high TC superconductivity is certainly one uh, holy grail of this. But we hope that by taking this approach of developing this kind of intuition and new theoretical method, they can be applied to something which is a bit more the real world, if you wish. So not at all a synthetic system any longer. And of course, if we push one step further, we also hope that the development of all these new theoretical methods uh, will help at some point develop applications. So it's actually interesting to Google uh, applications of strongly correlated matter. So strongly correlated matter means ensemble of particles where the dominant energy scales are the, uh, the energies, uh, between the interaction energies between the particles. And if you Google that, actually, you find a lot of things that have to do with energy management. So essentially, uh, solar panel, batteries, uh, the chemical reactions at the electrodes of batteries. So this is uh, all places where strongly correlated matters uh, actually play a strong role and which are actually not so well understood. So the hope is that by understanding this intuitive many-body uh, system, of uh, this toy many-body system, one day we will make progress in the understanding of material science. We're not there yet quite, but uh, hopefully one day it will become the case. So in our group, we study this uh, with three different platforms. Uh, and we have first these uh, arrays of individual atoms. So I'm going to discuss a bit more of that. So typically, the distance between the atoms is very far, uh, very large, so a few micrometers. So we need to induce the interactions by precisely exciting them to Rydberg state, as you will see. Uh, we have another experiment where we, instead of having individual atoms, we have a very dense atomic cloud. It's laser cooled. And there we shine light. So the light is going to induce the dipoles, and we're going to see how it affects uh, the way the system scatters light. And we have some a new experiment that uh, started in our group uh, two or three years ago now, uh, from our younger uh, staff member, so Igor, uh, which was to trap this prosium atom. So I'm not going to discuss too much about this project, but essentially the idea is to study this physics, which I'm going to discuss a bit more during my talk, using the tools that we have developed uh, with uh, the arrays of tweezers. Uh, the, the idea is to do some kind of quantum optics uh, at the wavelength uh, with an interaction energy which could uh, dominate at the wavelength uh, distance. Okay, so essentially those two systems implement spin models and essentially kind of the you know, common theme of all what we do is studying many body physics uh, through spin models. Uh, hopefully it will become apparent in a minute. So this is what I'm going to discuss. So the talk will be split in uh, essentially uh, two thirds, one third. So I will spend two thirds uh, of my time trying to explain you what happens if you take an ensemble of Rydberg atoms that interact by the dipolar interactions, what you can do when you place it out of equilibrium, what it generates. And the second uh, part of the talk will be <coughs> devoted to the light scattering in dense ensemble, uh, where we'll try to see that we can measure that this ensemble, due to the interaction, generates non-classical state of light. So completely different from what a laser would give, for example. So here, this will be the Rydberg. Here, it will be optical dipoles. And kind of the common theme that we're going to discuss are spin correlations. So essentially, the big questions we're asking in those two, uh, two parts are if you just take the spin degrees of freedom, so each system is a kind of a two-level system, is the product, the correlations between the spin states, so sigma is the usual Pauli matrices and describing a, poly, uh, uh, a spin system, is the uh, correlation between the spins the product of the correlations of, of the average? So do we have a mean field description or are we beyond mean field? So that's uh, the, the, the question we're asking in there. So let me start with the first part, which uh, once again was a collaboration between Norm Yao and Tomaso Rosilde, uh, so Norm in uh, Harvard and Tomaso in Nyon, and uh, together with their team, uh, which is what happens if you place a system of interacting uh, dipoles out of equilibrium. So the system we're going to consider are spin one half system. Okay, so that's the theoretical description. The spins are pinned in space, so they do not move. There is no motion of the particles carrying the spins. 
And those spins, we're going to make them interact by interaction, which is called the XY interaction. So this is also another word of saying the flip-flop interaction. So this is an interaction that allows one spin to flip while the other one flip back. Okay, so this is this kind of flip-flop interaction that you have there. So this is something which is actually very often used if you want to describe a quantum magnet, or also if you want to describe the propagation of excitations in certain systems, like for example, organic polymers. And because you can imagine a chain of spin down, and then you flip one spin and you look at how this spin propagates uh, in this system. Uh, the thing that we're going to look at is what happens when the coupling here is actually a dipolar interaction. So that's something that scales like one of our cube, and you will see in a minute why it's interesting that it's a long-range interaction. So this is relevant for actually many synthetic matter. Um, it's relevant actually in real materials, and you have magnetic moments, but usually this interaction is pretty weak. Uh, but it's also relevant to polar molecules. I mean, it's very well represented here in the group of Unier, for example. Uh, magnetic atoms as well, you can have envy centers, and you can have interactions between the, uh, the, the magnetic moment of uh, carbon-13 and on the envy centers, and also to the, uh, the, the Rydberg atom. So this is relevant, this kind of Hamiltonians, to a whole class of uh, synthetic matter. And so why is it interesting? It's interesting because if you have a one over R cube interaction, there is a very interesting mechanism and concept that pops in, is the concept of frustration. So let's assume that I have an antiferromagnetic coupling, which is to say an interaction that has a tendency to prepare an antiferromagnetic correlation, a spin up with a spin down. So if I place this uh, thing uh, on the, from the, the spins on the on a square, essentially you try to minimize the energy here by having a spin up, a spin down, the same thing there, but the consequence is that then you will have here a ferromagnetic interaction, a ferromagnetic, uh, sorry, uh, ordering. But the problem is that this is in competition with the anti-ferromagnetic uh, interaction, which has a tendency to create uh, opposite uh, spin direction. So, I mean, this is the competition between those two mechanisms, the antiferromagnetic here and the antiferromagnetic along the diagonal, which leads to frustration and interesting quantum fluctuations in the system. So, uh, the question we're going to ask is what happens if you place this system out of equilibrium? So, uh, this is what I'm going to discuss. So, the platform we're using here is an array of atoms. So, essentially, what you see in this picture is a fluorescence image of about 200 atoms. Uh, each of the points corresponds to fluorescence light that we collect on a CCD camera. These atoms are separated by typically a few micrometers, and we can vary this distance. And so the atoms are trapped in what is called an optical tweezer. So this is a laser beam, which is focused, and at the focal plane, uh, you have uh, a minimum of energy, so the atoms are going to be trapped there. Uh, in order to have many of these traps, what we do is we impinge the laser beam, ensuring the trapping, onto a diffraction grating, essentially. It's called a special light modulator, so it's a kind of an expensive version of a diffraction grating that kind of diffracts the laser, the trapping laser, into many spots, and each of the spots is a trap, and then we measure uh, the system. So that was something that started, actually, at the Institute Optic uh, with the work of Philippe Granger uh, more than 20 years ago now, and that uh, we've taken over and expanded uh, over... <coughs> Uh, over the last 20 years. So, I mean, these atoms can be arranged in different geometries. I will stick essentially to the TD geometry, but we can also arrange them in one dimension, two dimension with various configuration, also in three dimensions uh, if we want. And the Eiffel Tower I showed you on the first slide was actually done this way. Okay, so this is the platform. I'm going to say more about that. So we have an ensemble of atoms that are pinned in space. And of course, they are very far in, uh, uh, as far as the distance is concerned. And uh, you need to make them interact. So the way to make the atoms interact is an idea that was put forward in the early 2000s, is to promote them to a highly excited state, which is called the Rydberg state. I mean, so a Rydberg atom is not, I mean, it's not something you find in a periodic table. Huh? It's just any atoms can be made a Rydberg simply by exciting two states that are close to the ionization threshold. So they correspond to state with very large principal quantum numbers. So if you want to have a classical picture of the atoms, it's the electron uh, cycling around uh, the nucleus with a radius which can be hundreds of nanometers, so very large uh, object. So the consequence of such a large orbit is actually twofold. The first one is that the lifetime of an atom in the Rydberg state is quite long. So quite long, I mean, we should not exaggerate, but essentially it's a few hundred microseconds. It's much, much longer than if you were on a low-lying state, because then it would only be like tens of nanoseconds. So you have an increase by, let's say, three, four orders of magnitude of the lifetime. And you will see why it's long enough in a minute. So the second important property, which builds on this classical picture, is as the plus and minus are very well separated, two atoms close by will interact by a dipole interactions. 
very strongly, and the dipole matrix element square like the, the, the scale like the square of the principal quantum number. And so the consequence is that you have large dipole-dipole interactions. So just as a rule of thumb or a kind of order of magnitude, if you take two atoms separated by 10 micrometers, uh, the typical strength of the energy impressed in megahertz, and you will see why I use this unit in a minute, is in the megahertz range. So this is telling you that any dynamics which is induced by the interaction is going to take place in a time which is a sub-microsecond. So now you see why the 100 microsecond, although not super long, is long enough to be able to study coherent dynamics of the system. Okay, so uh, usually when people think about Rydberg atoms, they have in mind the van der Waals interactions, and that's exactly what uh, people here study, but that's not what we're going to use as the interaction. We're going to use another interaction, which is called the flip-flop interaction. So everything we're going to do now is going to occur in the Rydberg manifold. So the experiment is the following one. We start with the atoms in their ground state in the tweezer, with a laser, a combination of laser, we just excite them to a particular specific Rydberg state, and uh, we just completely ignore the low-lying state for now. Okay, so everything is going to happen between two Rydberg states that are connected by a dipole uh, transition. So one will be called spin up, the other one will be called spin down, eh? so that would be the language we will use. And actually, importantly, it's kind of easy to manipulate those states by driving uh, with a microwave a Rabi flop. So this is an example of a Rabi oscillation on a single atom, single Rydberg atoms, between the states 60S and 60P. Okay. And this microwave I'm going to use quite a lot in what is going. So remember that uh, this is a coherent manipulation of this spin uh, system. From the point of view of the interaction, the thing which is interesting is that if you start with a spin up and the other one in a spin down, that corresponds to one in the excited state, the excited Rydberg state, so to speak, and the other one in the ground Rydberg state, then they can exchange their state with a strength which is uh, 1 over RQ, the square over RQ. So this is an example <coughs> for the particular state that we're going to study in uh, there of a flip-flop interaction measured on just two atoms. So, I mean, of course, it's an experiment, so the thing is not infinitely uh, coherent, at some point it damps. Uh, but essentially, having prepared one atom in spin-up and the other one in spin-down, you measure after some time what's the state of each of the atoms, and you see that they kind of oscillate in phase opposition. This is the flip-flop interaction, which you describe by this sigma plus, sigma minus type of interaction. In condensed matter physics, people prefer to write it slightly differently. They write it like an XX plus YY interactions, hence the name of XY, but okay. Um, it's not too important for what I'm going to discuss now. <coughs> So, the experiment we're going to do is the following one. Let's start with the atoms all prepared, say, in spin up. And at some point, we apply a microwave pulse in order to uh, place the atoms in the XY plane. And so, I'm using the language of the Bloch sphere, for those of you who are familiar with that. But essentially, it means that initially, the spins point along Z. I apply a microwave pulse, and each of the spins now points in the XY plane, and is actually a superposition of being up plus down. So, because the spin up and the spin down interact, you will see a dynamics of this state under the Hamiltonian, uh, which the, the, the wave function is going to evolve under the XY Hamiltonian. And if after some time we measure the, whole, uh, the, the full magnetization in the Y plane, uh, this is the kind of curve that we obtain. So this is once again the average magnetization. So initially you prepare the magnetization, let's say, along Y, one of the two axes, doesn't really matter. Then the state is going to evolve, and after some time, I measure what's the magnetization. Okay, and we do that for different system size. So what you observe is that starting from a strong magnetization, this kind of magnetization shrinks down. So essentially, you depolarize the sample, which is not totally surprising, considering the fact that essentially each of these two states are going to evolve because of the interaction energy. So you're going to scramble the state, and it's going to deface. Uh, the thing is, which is interesting here is that this dephasing seems to depend actually on the size uh, of the system, but the thing which is not completely obvious uh, at first sight is that it depolarizes slower if you have more atoms. Okay, the, the, actually there is some kind of robustness in having many atoms, it's much longer uh, to depolarize. So the first thing is that interaction depolarizes, the second thing is that can we ask if and more than just a depolarization, it has something interesting in terms of the correlations between the atoms. So can this generate some form of entanglement? So this is the question we're going to look at. And so before I do that, I will do some kind of a sidetrack and reminding you uh, maybe something that not everyone is familiar with, although there is actually pioneering and very important work done here at GILA, uh, which is the spin uh, squeezing using what is called the one-axis twisting model. 
So the idea is the following, is that <coughs> you can describe this collective uh, spin, that is, uh, this ensemble of spin, as a collective spin, so this is the sum of the spin of each of the atoms, and represent that on a, collect on a Bloch sphere. So essentially, the state that we have produced along the y-axis correspond to what is called a coherent spin state. So because of the Heisenberg relation and the commutation of the, 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 the spin components, you will have some kind of intrinsic noise here, which is a quantum noise around this coherent state. So now if you assume that you have an interaction between the spins that scales, so for the moment don't ask where it's coming from, assume that it exists, that scales as SZ square, the total spin square. What's going to happen if you have this is that essentially the Bloch vector is going to rotate, but the speed or the angle at which you rotate is different on the equator or out of the equator. And because the angle is just proportional to AZ. So essentially it means that this kind of spherical noise, this uh, circular noise, is going to be sheared into an ellipse wrapping along the sphere. And so it means now that I can have a direction where the noise is smaller than actually the initial noise. So in order to do that, you need this AZ square interaction. And if I rewrite it in terms of individual spin, this is what is called an all to all connection. So essentially, you need all the spins to be connected to all the other spins. So this is a bit unphysical, it looks like. Uh, you will see how you, you, you do that in practice. But if you want to characterize the, the squeezing, the degrees of, uh, of squeezing of this, you're going to consider the variance along the small axis divided by the length square of the, of the, of the <clears throat> of the total spin. It's very important to divide that because it means that as uh, the system depolarizes, if you forget that, you may uh, fool yourself in terms of squeezing. So why is this quantity interesting? I mean, this is a quantity that was uh, introduced actually early on, uh, so in the early 90s, actually at NIST here uh, in Boulder. Uh, and it's because if you do a measurement using your spins, you want to measure like the resonant frequency between the two spins, for example, you can do what is called Ramsey interferometry, and you have some kind of intrinsic noise, which is called the standard quantum limit. This is the noise that you would have on your measurement if you have a coherent spin state here. But if you manage to squeeze, to squeeze the state, then the ultimate noise is actually reduced precisely by the squeezing parameter. So it means that you can have a better resolution of your sensor than if you were operating with an ensemble of coherent independent atoms. The thing which is important is that the more atoms you have in this model, the better the squeezing. So essentially it's case like the, uh, the number of particles that are involved to the power two thirds. So people have done that in many uh, different settings as early as uh, in the uh, mid nineties. So I'm not going to describe too much this method, but essentially there is a way to generate this all to all interaction using this system. And actually I should point out very important uh, system because this is exactly what is done here in the group of James Thompson's, for example, where he has nearly the, the record of, um, of squeezing and minus 18, minus 20 dBs. Uh, people have done that also with BECs, with uh, hot vapors, but also with iron crystals. And so people have demonstrated that, that is useful. I mean, there's now a clock which operates and which is a bit better using a squeezed uh, state with respect to having an independent atom. So now, we, that's not the interaction we have. We don't have this AZ square interaction, we've got a dipolar interaction. So we've got something which is one over R cube XX plus YY. So it's not exactly a ZZ all to all connection, but because it's one over R cube, it's actually not so bad. I mean, it's something which is reasonably long range. So the question is, does it lead to squeezing? And is this squeezing also scaling with the number of particles. And there are two different questions here. Do you generate squeezing and is the squeezing scalable? Uh, in views of application, this is important to have it scalable. And the predictions are actually yes, and actually you recognize a few names here. We kind of predicted that not that long ago, actually, and I think it's like a few years old. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> before I try to, uh, to, to show you the data, I would like to go through uh, one uh, slide of theory, which is going to be useful for also uh, measuring the dispersion relation. So, the basic theory to describe about that is the following. This is called the rotor spin wave theory. So that's something that was put forward by many other authors. I mean, I think that Tommaso Rosilde is the one who kind of wrap uh, everything together. But so you start from this Hamiltonian, xx plus yy, and you do something which is very common when you want to describe the excitations in spin system. You uh, transform the spin operators into creation operators of uh, creating a, a particle with a given uh, momentum, okay? And then, uh, so you transform your spin model into a particle model. And if you do that, you end up with, and there is a lot of uh, theoretical details and to, uh, swept under the rug, but still it can be done, and even I can do it, so it's not so complicated. 
uh, you end up with an Hamiltonian, so which, that's the same Hamiltonian under some kind of approximation, you neglect some terms, which are three, three components, a ground state energy, and then there is something which looks like an SZ square divided by a momentum of inertia, I, and then you've got a term which uh, describes the fluctuations above this. So essentially, <coughs> this first term here is an effective collective spin dynamic. So essentially, you can say that this K is essentially the total spin of the system. It's kind of an approximation, but nearly there. And so essentially, this is exactly the physics of the rotor, which is involved in the one-axis twisted model. The thing which is interesting is that you can even calculate the momentum of inertia, and this momentum of inertia scales like the number of particles. So the more particles you have, the heavier your rotor is. And it's divided by the strength of the interaction energy, which is nothing but summing uh, all the, you know, the contribution uh, of the one over R cube uh, interactions. Okay, so uh, because you have, if you neglect this term, the rotor part, it's exactly the, the one axis twisted model that you have. Therefore, you are expecting that this system can squeeze and you are expecting that because the one axis twisted model leads to scalable squeezing, this will also lead to scalable squeezing. That's the point. The second part here is the spin wave. Okay, so these are the excitation that we're also going to measure. So in a sense, I mean, it looks like a bit bizarre, this thing, but think about just a piece of crystal at a given temperature. I just moved a piece of uh, copper, for example. I have a macroscopic P square of a 2M. That's the kinetic energy. It's exactly the equivalent of the rotor. That's the collective variable. And on top of that, I can have the phonons on the system in the center of mass. So that's exactly the same kind of decomposition which is done here. So let's try to measure that in the lab. So go back to the experiment. We quench the system into the XY plane, let the thing evolve. And after some time, we're going to measure the variance along two different axes that are orthogonal. So essentially as a function of the angle we have here. So, I mean, we should first have a place where the variance is large, a place where the variance is small. So that's exactly what we measure here. This is the variance that we measure after a given evolution time. And we can compare that with uh, the initial state where we had what is called the standard quantum limit. So essentially what we observe here is indeed a place where you have reduced the quantum fluctuation with respect to an ensemble of independent atom as we have at t equals zero, and because they didn't have the time to interact. So now you can do this experiment by uh, varying the time after which you do the measurement. You let the, the, the system evolve, you measure the variance. So essentially you would find that the variance kind of decreases. At the same time, the polarization, the system depolarizes. And so in blue, this is the variance. In red, this is the depolarization. And therefore, you can construct this squeezing parameter. And you do see that after a given evolution times, this squeezing parameter is indeed below one, which is telling us that there is squeezing. It's certainly not a world record of squeezing. It's only minus four, minus three dB, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but still, it's telling you that you can generate with the dipolar interaction some squeezing, which can be useful for metrology. So now, let's go back to the initial figure I showed you about this kind of depolarization of the system. We can understand now why the more atom you have in the ensemble uh, leads to a less depolarization, or at least a polarization dynamic, which is actually slower. And this is simply because the momentum of inertia of our effective rotor is actually larger because it's scales like with the number of atoms. So the rotor is heavier, so it takes larger, uh, longer time to depolarize. So this is essentially this dynamics that we observe here. Uh, we can also look at uh, how the, the time at which the squeezing occurs as a function of the number of atoms. So it actually, the more atoms you have, the longer it takes uh, to achieve the best squeezing. And at the end of the day, we can plot, for example, the squeezing parameter as a number of the number of part, as a number of uh, the number of atoms in, as a function of the number of atoms in the in the system. And we do observe that the more atoms we have, the better the squeezing. Kind of interestingly, here uh, you've got the comparison with theory, which is uh, the simulation in this kind of you know uh, shady uh, shady uh, region here. But the comparison with the theory stopped at 64 atoms, while the experiment could be done at 100. And the reason for this is because actually it's extremely costly numerically to uh, go beyond this point. So it took a few weeks to simulate 64 atoms. It would have taken months to simulate 100 uh, with this system. So it's a bit in this sense that I'm saying that those systems kind of challenge a bit the theorists to develop better numerical methods to uh, explain the dynamics. So the conclusion here is that the uh, the dipolar, the squeezing is, uh, is scalable when you have a dipolar interaction. And that's a good news because actually it can be applied to many different platforms. 
This is a uh, Rydberg, not necessarily super useful to do metrology, but I mean, in the case of Yoon, for example, or uh, you could use like molecules and exactly see uh, the same kind of uh, squeezing. So at the same time, I should point out that are actually a very uh, nice work, and that's very nice because none of us discussed together. We're kind of all doing that in an independent way and essentially got connected through the theories, I believe. <laughs> and so in very different ways, we achieve also, uh, I find the, the group of Adam, the group of Monica Schleier-Smith in Stanford, and Christian Ross with uh, Ions actually uh, also obtain uh, this uh, kind of squeezing. Okay, so now uh, that the squeezing is done, so essentially what we've looked at is the collective dynamic of these many bodies. Yes, sorry. Yes, and the power is very far from the expected one. But exactly. you have to remember that the reason for this is we are only operating with 100 atoms. And it's not enough to be in a regime where the power laws start to matter because the one over n to the two third is a limit when n goes to infinity, so to speak, or is very large. So, so, so even the theoretically, we are not, if everything were perfect on the experiment, we are not expecting the power law n to the two third. We would expect scaling, but not with the power law. But um, when you have less number of atoms, the system is more collective, yes? Because, I mean, Sorry, when, we have when you have more at a less number of atoms, the systems tend to be a little bit more collective, yes? Because you don't see completely, for example, if you have two atoms, you have all two all interactions. So sometimes it's the system size that if it's limited is, is, is going to not explore yeah, the full the power law. Yeah, but the squeezing is very small then. The, the squeezing is small, but, so. but the, yeah. So, so, so when you do the theory, uh, the theory does predict exactly uh, this no, power? I mean, the theory predicts that it starts kind of quadratically and you expect this kind of thing before it breaks. So this is the squeezing parameter mm -hmm. as a function of the number of atoms. You would expect this kind of behavior before it goes linear with one to the two. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of start quadratically. Yes. So, so I'm asking because typically, at least for with, when we have to include in, in the other experiment, is that the coherence is what kills the scaling. And the, the, in order to account for the power yeah, so decay. I, I mean, maybe I can show you later the, the exact curve where we've, I mean, the theory and, and the addition of all the imperfections. Oh, okay. And you will mm -hmm. see that, I mean, in order to have really the scaling law, one to the n to the two third, we would need to have many more atoms than what we have. Okay, okay. Uh, typically an order of magnitude larger. So. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So I hope someone will do the experiment one day. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so that was kind of the collective part. So now let's try to look at the second part. So it's kind of an interesting prediction for many body physics that was actually not that long ago, which is that you have the ground state of the system, and above this ground state, you've got some kind of excitations. And you may remember from your condensed matter physics textbook that you describe that by what is called magnon, so spin wave excitation of your ferromagnetic state or antiferromagnetic state. So this is exactly what we have here. It's just that we can relate the frequency of these spin waves to the strength of the uh, interaction energy. So essentially, this is the Fourier transform of the potential. Uh, so this is something which is well known when you do that. It's just that it's different depending whether you are ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic interaction. So you're not expecting the same behavior of the spin wave, whether you have ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic uh, interactions. So let's assume first that your interactions were nearest neighbor interaction. Okay, that's usually the textbook case. I mean, if you open the Ashcroft Mermin or whatever textbook in, in solid state physics, you will find nearest neighbor type of interaction. So for the ferro and the antiferro, you expect a linear dependence of the spin wave with the uh, quasi momentum uh, of, the, of the spin wave. Okay, so essentially it scales proportionally, so you can define the speed of sound if you wish. Now, the fact that you have a dipolar interaction modifies this. So it modifies this in a way that the ferromagnetic interaction now will scale like the square root of the, uh, the, 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 the momentum. So it's very bizarre, this behavior, because it's telling you that there's a divergence of the group velocity, which is the omega over dq. And in the antiferromagnetic coupling case, you don't have that. The antiferromagnetic remains exactly the same whether you have dipolar or nearest neighbor. So it's only the ferromagnetic part which is uh, affected. And one way to understand why the antiferromagnet is not affected is precisely because of the existence of frustration. So if you have kind of an antiferromagnetic order, if you wish, what the frustration does is that it allows the spin to kind of fluctuate and reduce the effective range of the interaction. So frustration makes your one over R cube effectively shorter range in a sense. And so that's the reason why you kind of recover the behavior of the uh, antiferromagnet. So let's try to measure that. So the idea here is the following. How do you measure 
the excitation uh, above the ground state of your system. We do not prepare the ground state of the system. Right? This is a many body system which uh, we only prepare an approximation of the ground state. What is the approximation? In the case of the ferromagnet, remember we start from the ferromagnetic along Z, we quench it, we've got some kind of ferromagnet in the XY plane, but this is not the true ground state of the system. It's more complicated than that. The true ground state of the system is kind of a correlated state, it's just not a product state. So what is the difference between this kind of mean field ground state that we prepare and the true ground state? But this is precisely the excitation. Those are the spin waves that we're injecting in the system. So in a sense, just by looking at how the correlations in the system propagates as a function of space, we will be able to extract the, uh, the correlations, and so the, 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 the dispersion relations. How does it work? It turns out that you can measure what is called the time-dependent structure factor. I will show you that. And this is nothing but the Fourier transform in space of the spatial correlation. So, and as we can follow the state of each of the spin as a function of time, we can construct these uh, correlations here. So you take the Fourier transform, and actually it turns out that if you do a bit of math and rewrite it, you can rewrite this Fourier transform as a sigma z q, sigma z minus q. So what this thing does is that this quantity, the correlations or the, trans the Fourier transform of this correlation corresponds to the creation of pairs q minus q, which actually have the same energy. So essentially what you have is you have this quantity which will oscillate at two times the dispersion relation because you can create pairs uh, of, uh, of uh, excitations in the system. It turns out that if you apply the spin wave theory, that's precisely what you find. I mean, this AZ actually uh, oscillates at twice this. So this gives now the recipe to measure the dispersion relation. Start by quenching the system in a mean field ground state. This is not the true ground state. The difference is precisely the spin wave. So the system should evolve as a function of time. And from that, you can extract the dispersion relation. So this is something uh, which, uh, I mean, that's the first time that this way of doing it is actually done. Usually people prepare the ground state and excite uh, above the ground state. So let's try to do that. First for the ferromagnet, exactly the same experiment as the one I described for the squeezing. We do this, and as a, for, as a, at a given time, so t equals zero, we measure the correlation. So essentially, we have access to the state of each of the atoms, so we can build the correlation function sigma z, sigma z. So we've got something which is essentially uh, almost no correlation at t equals zero. And then as time evolves, we see that there is some kind of evolution of the correlations. I mean, blue means negative correlation. This is this. Red means positive correlations. And so we can make this 2D plot. It's 2D because we have a 2D array huh, of 10 by 10 atom. The 2D plot becomes a 1D uh, variable. As a function of time, now I can write the distance d here and how the correlation spread as a function of time. So what we see is that at short time, you do see the appearance of anti-correlations that are very strong. And actually exactly at the origin of the squeezing that we discussed before. And then you've got those kind of plumes of positive correlations in the system. You can tr Fourier transform this for every time as a function of space, and you will have some kind of oscillations, which are precisely the oscillation that we are looking for. I mean, it's kind of obvious that it's a bit more subtle than that because as you can see here, there are many frequencies, so you have to believe me and there is a way to analyze the data in such a way that you can extract from this the, uh, the, the frequency uh, of the, the dispersion relation, so uh, as a function of the momentum, and we do see that indeed it's not linear. So the data are the red dots, and all the other uh, dots correspond to various theories, that, uh, which are always approximate theories, uh, that kind of uh, have undergone the same treatment as the data, the analysis uh, we did on the data. And so indeed, you observe that there is this nonlinear dispersion relation. Uh, you can do a bit more than that and kind of, I mean, it's obvious that it's a bit hard to fit a frequency here, but the prediction of the linear spin wave theory tells you that the average should actually also be related to dispersion relation. If you do this analysis, you've got less noise. It's easier to fit, but okay. Now, let's try to do the same thing, but for the antiferromagnetic case. The problem we have is that in our system, the interaction is ferromagnetic. So the J is positive. So how can I access the antiferromagnets? Just using the following trick. If I prepare now an antiferromagnet along X, instead of preparing the lowest energy state, I prepare the most highly excited state. But the most highly excited state of H, uh, XY, the XY Hamiltonian, is actually the ground state of minus H, XY. 
And the dynamics under minus h or plus h is exactly the same. Okay, so in this way, by preparing an antiferromagnet, I can follow the dynamics of the antiferromagnetic state. And indeed, we've done this, and we could observe, so we can, I can discuss kind of a lot this, but essentially now we observe that there is a difference in uh, the dispersion relation, which is now nearly linear with the momentum. Thing which is kind of obvious from here, and that's actually interesting, so I'm just showing you uh, that at you, but essentially you see that there is a lot of damping in the oscillations on the X prime. If we're using the spin wave theory, we would have this kind of continuous oscillation. So where is this damping coming from? It's coming from something actually interesting. It's the fact that now in your system, you prepare the mean field ground state, but this mean field ground state is actually very far from the true ground state of the system. So you've injected in the system a lot of spin waves, and those spin waves will interact. And that's the interaction of the spin wave which will lead to this kind of damping. And so this is actually very, uh, not that often that you can directly see the interaction between the excitations in the system. Okay, so the bottom line of this is that indeed there was this prediction, which is about 10 years old, that you should have a difference in the dispersion relation whether uh, you have ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic interaction. And indeed, this is what we measure here. Well, there is some kind of limitations of our platforms. And uh, in order to be able this, to say that it's square root of Q, we need points here. Okay, but the problem is that the, small, the, the, the points that you can only put depends on the system size. So if we wanted to have really a data which would be interesting here, we would need to increase by quite a lot the system. Okay, so um, <clears throat> actually I'm realizing how much time do I have? I don't want to overdo it. I have about 10 minutes or something like that. Okay, well, I just want to show you very briefly what we are doing those days. So for those of you who are not following a switch of your brain, uh, but essentially the kind of thing we're trying to add are a few tools to the platform, which is trying to uh, measure or to apply some kind of local rotation. So it's very important when you try to describe many body system to be able to measure in various bases. So for example, you want to build a correlation which is not an XX correlation, but XY or XYZ type of correlation. So for that, we've implemented the methods to, to do this kind of thing. And with that, we can measure what are called some kind of chirality, which signs the fact that there is some kind of current in the state you've prepared. So that's something we've done recently. And uh, the thing that we have been trying to do with Normiao for quite some time, which actually started all this project, is to observe actually, to change the geometry of the ensemble, uh, go to what is called a Kagome array and try to find signature of what is called a Dirac spin liquid, which is something that has been predicted and which is extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to prepare in the lab. So there are actually two problems here which are interesting. There is the experimental challenge of generating a, a machine or which, which is good enough in order to observe that, so to have little imperfections. But also there is a theory challenge, which is how do you characterize the spin liquid in a, in a way that uh, makes them unambiguous. And this is actually something that we're trying to do, and uh, the progress is a bit slow because it's hard. And we're also looking at uh, 1D physics. Okay, so if I have about 10 minutes left, I don't want to overdo it. I just give you a, a flavor of what we do on the other project because it's kind of connected to this. So I'm probably not going to go through all uh, the, the second part. But the essential idea of this started in our group like a long time ago. <clears throat> it's what happens if you take a dense atomic ensemble and you shine light on it. Well, I mean, of course, uh, if you only have a bunch of individual atoms or very dilute gas, it's kind of easy. We know essentially everything. And you go to a quantum optics textbook, we know uh, how to describe spontaneous emission. We know how to describe the, the evolution of the population uh, when we drive the system in essentially any regime. So this is not at all the problem. The problem becomes much more interesting as soon as the particles can be made close enough. In this way, an atom that now has been excited by your laser has two ways to decay. It can either spontaneously emit light, as it would in a completely dilute ensemble, or the excitation of this two-level system can jump on a nearby atom. So you've got two decay channels for a given atom. But you see that now all the atoms kind of participate to the scattering. And so another way to say it classically is just to say, I have all my classical dipole, and those classical dipoles are all going to interact with each other because they are close enough. And therefore, you have a collective scattering. So kind of the buzzword here that has been around for more than 60 years, even more, is the word super radiance. So essentially, there's a collective emission of light from this atomic ensemble. 
Okay, so uh, this is a very so this is a topic which I have to admit uh, that there was a lot going on in the 70s and 80s, and then it becomes a very uh, old-fashioned topic for many years, and then there is a revival of it, essentially driven. I mean, there is a lot of work being done uh, here in Gila, uh, from <coughs> by relooking at this from different point of view. I mean, you can build some kind of atom light interface in this way, uh, using the fact that light can be collective coupled to uh, ensembles. You can. Just say in a different way, I mean, no, all those spins interacting, they will create a nonlinear medium. And each time I have a nonlinear medium, I can generate interactions between photons. So that's another way to look at it. You can also look at it, and that's what we're going to do, through the eyes of driven dissipative systems. So essentially now you've got an interplay between the drive by the laser and the fact that the system can uh, spontaneously emit, but in a collective way. So you can sustain phases non-equilibrium phases of matter, and that can also undergo, depending on the parameters, uh, some kind of phase transition. So essentially, this is this, <coughs> which we're going to look at, the interplay between the collective dissipation and the drive, and we're going to ask two questions. Does it lead to correlations between the atoms, and can it lead to light, which is non-classical? Okay, so I'm just, I'm not going to go through all what we've done here, I'm just flashing a bit the system we have. So what we have now, it's completely different from the previous uh, uh, system and where we had ensemble of individual atoms. Here you've got a single laser beam and this, in this laser beam we put a very elongated cloud. So it's a single elongated beam. So at the end of the day we've got a cloud which is about 50 wavelength in length and half a wavelength uh, in the transverse direction. And so very importantly, uh, that's a trick that we always play as experimentalists, you want to be as close as possible to the theoretical description, so you want to have an ensemble of two-level atoms. But the problem is that we use rubidium atoms, and this is everything but a two-level system. But if you apply a strong enough magnetic field, you are able to isolate a closed transition. This is what we do. Okay, so now you've got an ensemble of two-level atoms, exactly what, uh, in principle, the theory is like. Uh, the thing which is interesting with this thing, so we have a system where we can observe the cloud from two directions, either along the axis of the cloud or perpendicular to it. And that allows us to measure two different uh, types of observables. If we measure <coughs> perpendicular to the axis, we're going to measure the population, and if we measure here, we're going to measure the atomic correlation. How does it work? You have to remember that the field which is scattered by the atomic ensemble is the sum of the spin, uh, or, or, the di or each of the dipoles, sorry, I should say. So now, if you measure the intensity, the intensity is kind of the E minus E plus here, it has two contributions, the diagonal terms and the off-diagonal terms. This, you have N of them, the number of atoms. This corresponds to the population of each of the atoms. And here, you've got the correlations between the dipoles, and you've got N square of them. So interestingly, if you look here, because the position of the atoms is random, the phase factor kind of kill this term. So we have access to the population of each of the atoms. While if we are looking along this uh, axis here, we have access instead to the correlations between the dipoles. So you see that by looking in two different directions, you access the many body aspect of the system or the single uh, particle aspect uh, of uh, the atoms. Okay, so this is an experiment we've done, and so essentially uh, this is the, 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 an experiment where at some point we just take our elongated cloud, turn on the light. So we should observe if we have a small number of atoms, something which looks like the Rabi oscillations of this system driven by light. And this is indeed what we observe. If we have a small number of atoms, typically 300, it's in good agreement with the solution of the Bloch equation that you learn in quantum optics just for a single particle. And this is measurement which is done along the axis of the cloud. And now we do exactly the same experiment, but now with many atoms. And what we see is a strong modification of the, uh, these uh, Rabi oscillations. And this is precisely because of those terms that signs the fact that there are correlations in, inside the system. Okay, so this is the influence of superradiance during the drive. Okay, so I'm going to skip uh, the thing here, uh, and the question we're going to see, so now you've seen that there are correlations, because this is uh, this kind of enhancement of the Rabi oscillation, so the next question we're going to ask, does the fact that there is a correlated medium leads to non-classical state of light? Things that cannot be described as a coherent state, uh, or for, uh, yeah, a coherent state. So in order to do that, we know in quantum optics what to do. We need to measure the intensity correlations of the light. This is the thing that distinguishes a classical light from a quantum light. 
This is called the G2 function of light, and it reveals non-classical correlations. And the, the way to measure that has been popularized uh, now more than 60 years ago by those two guys, Andre Brown and Twist, in the context of astronomy, actually. And this consists in placing here a beam splitter that splits the light into two, and you kind of measure the correlations or the coincidences on those two detectors as a function of time. So you count whether at a given, if you have a, uh, a click at time t, what's the probability to have another click at the same time t or a time later. So in order to uh, compare to, to explain what, what we've seen, so essentially I need to remind you maybe something that you may remember from your classical optics. If you have an ensemble of totally independent emitters, there is a relation between the correlation function of the field and the correlation function of the intensity. It's only true if you have independent emitters. Okay, so no correlations between them. And it's called the Ziegert relation. Essentially, it's G2 is 1 plus G1 square. Okay, and this has been measured in many different platforms. And usually, you use the Ziegert relation, the violation of the Ziegert relation, as a signature of the fact that you've got correlations on the light or correlated emitters. Okay, so let's try to do this. So we start with our atomic cloud. We release it in free space first, and we're going to build this kind of 2D map. So essentially, each time we've got a click at a given time, we just put one point here, and we uh, do it. So for the first detector, the second detector, and we're just going to wait until we're sure that the system have reached equilibrium, so steady state. And from that, we're going to measure the G2 function for this ensemble of you know, atoms in free space, very far, completely delayed. And essentially what we observe as a function of the delay between uh, T and T plus tau is this kind of oscillatory behavior. And the dotted line is the Ziegert relation. So essentially it's telling you well, there is nothing. Here the medium is totally uncorrelated. The Ziegert relation is completely fulfilled. You can kind of change the parameters and indeed it follows the Ziegert relation. Now let's try to do exactly the same thing. But now we're going to do it looking in two different directions, the direction which is perpendicular and the direction which is axial. And what we observe is that in the axial direction, in the super radiant uh, light, we have a violation of the Ziegert relation. Okay, so this is telling us that now the light that we have, or the medium that we're starting from, is correlated, and that's not too surprising because we said that in the case of super radiant, we have correlations between the system. So, the question we're going to ask, and it's probably kind of the most complicated slide, but essentially, can we, that this violation of the Ziegert relation leads to the fact that the statistic of the light which is emitted is non-Gaussian. And this is important because in case of quantum communication, people want to have some kind of non-Gaussian statistics. So I'm going to keep it short, but essentially the idea is the following. If you were assuming that the light coming out of your cloud is Gaussian, then you would be able to derive some kind of generalized uh, Ziegert relation where you've got 1 plus G1 square plus something which is the square of the uh, average dipole. And so now the question we're asking is that you see that if you got this minus here, it could very well explain this. Okay, the minus. So there, there would be nothing special, essentially. It would be uh, non-interesting. The point is that can we have an average? So essentially we have two ways to look at the violation here. Either we say Ziegert relation is not valid, in which case the emitters are correlated, or we would say that the light is non-Gaussian. And in both cases, this is actually a non-trivial thing. Both are remarkable in the sense that if you have an ensemble of atoms and you drive it perpendicularly, the dipoles do not have the phase relation compatible with the creation of a collective dipole. So this is something which is actually a non-trivial fact, the fact that uh, you would have an average dipole. Anyway. We've done this, and I'm going to keep it short because I think I'm running uh, nearly out uh, of time, but essentially the idea is that we have no average dipole and we can measure that. So this is actually kind of a neat thing because you do not understand the microscopic and yet you are able to make strong statement on the uh, nature of the light which is coming out. So essentially what we have is this violation of the Ziegert relation implies a non-Gaussian statistics of light. And if you want to understand why, and here for those of you who don't know the super radiant formalism, forget it, you're not going to understand, but there are a few experts in the audience. The idea is that it's precisely a competition between two things, super radiance, so this is what is called the decal ladder. So essentially you sort by the number of excitation in the system, your, uh, your, um, your, energy, uh, your energies. Essentially what super radiance tends to do in a strongly driven case, it tries to populate with equal population 
essentially all the stages. So essentially, it tries to maximize the variance of AZ square. But you've got another effect, which is the dipole-dipole interactions. And these dipole interactions, remember what I told you about the Rydberg, looks very much like a one-axis twisted model. So actually now, you've got the competition between the one-axis twisted model, which will have a tendency to minimize AZ square, with the super radians, which have a tendency to maximize AZ square. And the competition of those two things could lead on the Bloch sphere to the fact that you remove the state with the larger AZ. So when you project in order to have the electric field, you actually kind of drill a hole in this probability distribution. So this is one hand wavy argument, and I have to actually uh, just point out this argument is like two weeks old with a discussion we had with Michel Fleischer. So I'm not entirely sure it's true, but at least this is kind of a nice hand wavy explanation that we, uh, of the origin of this non-classical. Okay, so I think I should stop here, uh, really. So essentially, there is still a lot of things to work, but essentially, why is this thing interesting? Because if you have medium that generate non-classical light, potentially, they are very strong non-linear medium that can generate correlations between the photons. So that's exactly what is useful for some quantum information uh, processing task. And so I will stop here, and sorry for having been a bit long, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Very nice talk, Antoine. Um, I'm a little bit confused for the, from the last argument. You are talking about the steady state. Yes. And this, the one axis twisting for sure is only valid at short times. We, we, uh, I, mean, and, I would be happy to discuss that more. Okay. I just threw it at you because for me it was like un uh, unsatisfactory not to have some kind of whole wavy explanation of why you would have this non Gaussian mm -hmm. statistic coming up. This is one possible unwavy argument. I'm not saying more than that mm -hmm. at this okay, stage. So okay. I, I would be happy to okay. discuss more okay. the details. But essentially, okay. what we discussed with, Mich uh, with uh, Michael Fleischer is this possibility of having this kind of competition between the dipole dipole interaction and the drive, and, uh, which, uh, sorry, and the super radiance. Uh, and those two competitions would lead to kind of a non classical state. Yeah, but, but, but my concern is that at longer times, super radiance is not going to be also the main decay mechanisms is going to be single particle decoherence, depends on the regime that you, you have. Yes, super radiance is only for a small drive. For a strong drive, the single particle decoherence is the leading. Well, okay. yeah, okay. There is what we mean strong drive, and you know that we are kind of in the intermediate regime. Okay. So, but okay, let's discuss that in okay, more detail. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, for the Rydberg portion, a question about using this dipolar interaction compared to sort of the resonant or Rydberg blockade picture mm -hmm. that other groups are exploring. Um, you'd mentioned in the Outlook slide the role of disorder in systems like this. One nice thing, again, as not a Rydberg expert, um, that's nice about some of the blockade physics is that as long as you're within the blockade radius, you're very insensitive to the position of the atoms. Right. How does the dipolar physics that you're exploring sort of depend on how precisely yeah, yeah. you so, can so position that's an these atoms. Question. So, so the, I mean, I try to be a bit careful in the way because I mean, each time people hear about Rydberg in the context of arrays, they have in mind Rydberg blockade and Van der Waals interaction. Right. The Rydberg blockade is the fact that when you have two atoms that are, two Rydberg atoms that are close enough to each other, then it becomes, sorry, we have two atoms that are close enough to each other because the Rydberg interval, when they are in the Rydberg state interval very strongly, you cannot excite the two of them. Here, our atoms are very far on purpose. Mm -hmm. So we can excite all of them to Rydberg state, overcoming the Rydberg blockade. Okay, so the Rydberg blockade plays no role in, the, in that case. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> now the, 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 so the interaction that plays a role is resonant dipole dipole interaction, which is order of magnitude larger between S and P state than the Van der Waals interaction. Now the drawback of that is exactly what you're pointing. I become extremely sensitive to the exact positioning of the atoms. And actually, we paid a lot of effort uh, on the experiment to try to make sure that the interparticle distance was as homogeneous as possible. So this is actually, I was mentioning this work with Normia yeah. on spin liquid. That precisely one of the difficulties is to make sure that your positioning is exactly what you need and you don't favor one of the valence bond state as it is called. Sweet. So, thanks. I mean, those are the kind of separated pictures. So, uh, right, yeah. right. Because like in, in Misha's group, they're exploring uh, 
blockade generated right. spin, spin Although, liquids. Although, I mean, or... we could argue about exactly whether what I've seen is a spin liquid. That's I mean, exactly there is right. A lot of, uh, but, but near ground, again, so uh, sure. near yeah. ground state yeah. systems. Uh, but indeed, I mean, there was this kind of neat trick that using the blockade, you would be a bit more insensitive, not completely, but a bit more insensitive to the positional disorder. That's right. It seems <clears throat> very interesting, but very yeah. technically hard what yeah. you're working on here. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's, uh, the thing which I find interesting is that it's technically challenging for sure for us. But I mean, at the moment, even the theorists don't really know what is the order parameter, the non-local order parameter that we should look for. So I mean, there is an entire project just trying to do that. And in a sense, this is because those platforms are available. So, you know, th those quantum simulators, I don't think that, I mean, I don't know whether we'll make any discovery any day, but at least they are pushing people to think about differently about these many body problems. Just they, they act as a teaser, if you wish. So I think it's one of their virtues. <coughs> The problem is that this mic is not very strong, so I need to move. Oh, I'll just I don't yell. Hear that. Uh, so the, in, at the end, is there, uh, I know there's not a general theory necessarily that people are confident in, but is there an understanding of why you have negative correlations at certain delay times no. for the G2? There's Essentially, at the moment, no one has any explanation. Because for super radiance, you'd sort of, you might not expect that. No. Uh, the, I, the problem is that I don't know what to expect. Uh, the, 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 I don't know. I mean, we have zero explanation. I mean, this is something that we observe very consistently. It seems that Michael Fleischer is trying to do the calculation and also observe that, but there is no understanding of why it gives that. Cool. So I mean, that's the reason I was trying to kind of come up with this kind of unwavy argument, at least for the non-classicality using this you know, competition, with all the caveat that Anna Maria pointed out. I mean, it's, it's not completely sure that it completely applies to the system, but at least, yeah. And uh, besides measuring the G2 functions and so on in the decay, uh, could you also measure the spectrum of the light? Or actually also on the atom sector, sure. actually do Ramsey spectroscopy and measuring the, yeah. the so, sort of mean field so shifts. So it's a very good so point. So what we have measured, so I have not shown you the data, we've measured the Molo triplet. Uh -huh. So we've measured exactly what you're saying, which is the Fourier transform of the G1 of tau. So this is the spectrum of the light. And essentially, it was the one consistent with independent atoms. So there is no modification of the Molo triplet. But the thing which is interesting is that people have done a lot of efforts trying to assess in the presence of strong dipole-dipole interaction, how would the Molo triplet be affected? Because people were hoping yeah. that you would see the effect on the Molo triplet of mm -hmm. the fact that the atoms would interact. First, it's heroic calculation, and second, always the effect is extremely small. The thing which is kind of neat with the G2 function, and we can discuss that more if you wish, is that it's a much more sensitive probe to the interactions between the atoms, which here is kind of revealed by having this G2, which is smaller than one and, uh, and kind of a lower. Okay. Uh, you might but just... in Ramsey sequence, we have not tried anything that could actually be interesting. But I'm just wondering, in the molar triplets, instead of just measuring the spectrum intensity distribution, maybe you go to the central peak and do phase sensitive measurements yes. to see phase shifts. And so okay, no, okay. So, and, and that's certainly, yeah. this is on the plan of what we have to do. Okay. I mean, we're building an experiment, unfortunately, at the moment, so we can, but that's exactly that. We want to measure the Wigner function anyway and, and all these kind of properties, which is exactly this homodyne detection yes. uh, by beating, uh, no, no, sure. I mean, th this has to be done for sure, yes. <clears throat> All right, yeah, maybe one more question. Did we have one up here? Or, yeah. Could you please comment on what kind of light you are getting? Uh, like, is a few photon fox state or some other non classical state no, but which you cannot characterize right now? No, no, I have no idea. Uh, and in a sense, I need to do the experiment that uh, Yoon is suggesting, which is to now measure. Uh, the Wigner function of the field. Yeah, it will give us an intuition of what it is. Because, I mean, one big question I mean, is non-Gaussian, okay, fine, mm -hmm. but it could be non-Gaussian and totally uninteresting. Mm -hmm. It becomes interesting when the Wigner function has a negative value. And that I don't know. There is no prediction. Okay. And, I mean, Michel Fleischer seems to say, no, you should have some negative Wigner function, but um, we have to measure it. I don't know. Okay. So, essentially, I cannot even give you a, uh, what is this field looking like. I don't know. And that uh, the negative correlation has a uh, relation with the number of atoms that you have in your... In your uh, the more atom you have, indeed, uh, the more uh, violation of Ziegert you have. Okay. For sure. Okay. Uh, so Good. it seems, indeed, to be a collective effect. Uh, so. okay. <clears throat> All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll make our way to the front here again. And let's uh, thank Antoine again for the wonderful talk. <laughs>